Does everybody still remember this, this picture? It's a picture, it's a very blurry picture actually, but it's a picture of a wolf. It's the first wolf in the Netherlands since 1869, when the last one was shot in uh, Limburg in the south of Netherlands. And since uh, so 150 years, we had to live without this animal, and now it is back. It is back in the Netherlands. This picture is taken uh, near Emmen, a border town uh, near the, the, the border of uh, Germany. Um, and it wasn't really a surprise that the wolf came back to the Netherlands because, well, it was encroaching westwards in Germany already for a, uh, almost a decade. But most of all, it wasn't a surprise because nature is doing actually quite well in the Netherlands and also in neighboring countries. For instance, if you look at Germany, at this moment, there's 3,500 square kilometers more forest in Germany than there was in 1990. And the same accounts for uh, the Netherlands. At the moment, there's 250 square kilometers more forest than in the 90s. And of course, this, this uh, gives large animals like the wolves more uh, space to roam about. Uh, and it's not only in, uh, here and in Germany, but actually in whole Europe. You have, for instance, the European bison, it's called the Vicent. It's doing quite well in Poland. And you have the brown bear, which is back in uh, Serbia and Kosovo, and it's expanding in its habitat in uh, Romania. So nature is actually doing quite well. And there's more good news, because did you know that our water quality and our air uh, quality they are as good as they were, and at most of the places even better than in 1960. So nature is bouncing back here in Europe after years of deterioration. Uh, and all these, these optimistic stories about the environment, they, they might feel a little bit uh, counterintuitive, maybe. At least when I found out, I've, when I found those facts, to me they were counterintuitive. Because I grew up with the idea that nature and humans, they were anti antipodes. I grew up with the idea that uh, everywhere humans came and everywhere humans uh, prospered, then nature suffered. So I grew up with the idea that, and may, probably the most of you too, I grew up with the idea that um, economic growth always walked hand in hand with uh, the destruction of the environment. They were two sides of the same metal. They were actually coupled. Um, and it is this, this notion, this old notion actually, which uh, started the green movements in the 60s and 70s. Uh, back then, um, uh, lots of books and reports uh, were written, like those two. Those two were very influ influential. You have, for instance, on the left side, you have uh, Limits to Growth. That was written by the Club of Rome, a very influential and large body of uh, respected scientists. And in this report, we were warned actually for the apocalypse. If we continued using uh, resources we did at the pace we were doing then, then civilization would explode. Earth couldn't sustain that. And, and something similar was in this book, uh, The Population Bomb. It's written by a very famous biologist, Paul Ehrlich, and as the title suggests, this is about um, the imminent growth of the population. The book is written in 1968, and he warned for this population growth. He said, in a couple of decades, there will be mass starvation event because the Earth can't sustain so many people. So in the 60s and the 70s, um, the future looked very bleak. We were heading for, in 2015, for a very filthy and poor planet. And of course, well, Back then, they thought, we have to have a solution for this. And what was their solution? They said, we should stop focusing on economic growth. We should actually do the opposite. We should degrowth. And not only that, they said, we should, as humanity, we should live more in harmony with nature. Because the more we live in harmony, that way we save the planet and the people. And I think this, sounds still, this might sound still quite appealing to a lot of you. But think about it. Is it really true? Is it really true that living in harmony with nature saves the people and the planet? 
Well, um, as you might have understood from the start of this uh, talk, um, this doesn't seem the case to anymore. Well, actually, the exact opposite seems to be the case. Because at this moment, it is in the richest countries, it is in the countries where people live if furthest away, in least harmony with nature, where there is room for nature again to rebound. It is in those, in those wealthy countries where there is room for rewilding, uh, for regreening. For instance, if you look at the Netherlands, um, our population grew from 11.5 million in 1960 to 17 million now. And in between, so between 1960 and 2010, our per capita, so per person income, quadrupled. So it expanded four times. And still, our water is cleaner, our air is cleaner, and we have our wolf back. So for the first time, the last decade, um, economic growth and the destruction of the environment, they're decoupled. And it is this, uh, this notion which started uh, a, new, a whole new green movement. And it's a group of people who call themselves eco-modernists. And I call myself an eco-modernist. And the main message of the eco-modernist is that we shouldn't live in harmony with nature. If we want to have a green and a prosperous planet, and isn't that what we all want, we shouldn't live in harmony with nature. No, we should do the exact opposite. We should decouple ourselves from nature. Um, and that way we will save both the, 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 the planet and the people. So we should move away from, the, from nature. So how do we do this? How, do this, how does this work? Uh, how do we decouple ourselves from nature? And how do we make sure that that way we uh, save the people and the planet? Well, three things. First of all, uh, we should intensify our agriculture, especially in developing in poorer countries where uh, subsistence, small-scale agriculture is still uh, very abundant. Because by intensifying agriculture, we increase yields, we lift people out of poverty, and we, at the same time, we save space for nature because we need less land for the same amount of food. Secondly, we should facilitate and stimulate uh, urbanization. So we should get the people from the countryside into the city, city especially in poorer country, because it's a city where the real economy starts. Thirdly, to make this all happen, we need a lot of energy. So we need to double, triple, quadruple our efforts to make the transition from uh, fossil fuels to green energy because that way we can grow, we can grow in a su sustainable way. So how does this work? How do those three things, well, let's call them overall modernization, uh, how do they save both the people and the planet? Um, well, that is because those three things can tame the two most destructive powers of humanity. And that is, first of all, large population growth. At the moment, we live with uh, around 7 billion people on this planet. And that will grow at the end of the century to somewhere between 9 and 13 billion people. And of course, more people means more, means more food to be produced, means more land to be cleared, means less space for nature. So, of course, that means we want, uh, we want to stay at the lower end, of course, of this projection. How do we do it? How do we make sure that we stay at the 9 billion and not get to 13 billion? Well, the key here is economic growth and urbanization. Because if you look around here in the Netherlands, in all the wealthiest countries where the economy is really booming, there women on average get only uh, uh, 2.1 children approximately. So families are very small in rich countries. But it's not only in rich countries. It is also in all the large cities in the developing countries. Because did you, for instance, know that in, in Dhaka, the capital of, uh, of Bangladesh, the average, the fertility rate, so the average uh, children per woman, is only two and a half. 
and Addis Ababa, which is the capital, capital of Ethiopia, which we see as a very poor country, there the fertility rate is only 1.6, so it's a lot lower even than in the Netherlands. The only place where people still get a lot of children, where families are still very large, that it is in the poorest countries. It is in the places where people live in closest harmonies with nature. So, and it's in rural Africa, so on the countryside of Africa, where the families are still very large. So their families can still consist of uh, six or seven uh, children. So why is that? Why is it that cities and cities, uh, so cities and rich, richer countries, how, why is it that the, the family size is so much smaller then? Well, the reason is actually quite simple. Of course, you don't need, in the city, you don't need all those hands anymore to work on the field. You don't need all those hands to secure your future, to secure your family plan, uh, your pension plan. And so in the city, family planning becomes a real option. And interestingly is that the few children who are born, they uh, have in the city access to education and healthcare. So that way you get a very positive uh, cascade. Fewer kids who go to school, kickstart the economy. So in that way, of course, um, because the population in those cities and in the wealthy countries stays at a low level, you take away the pressure of the, uh, of the population growth. Uh, secondly, the second um, human activity which can be tamed by overall modernization is agriculture. And agriculture is really destructive. Because I used to think that um, the destruction of the planet started somewhere, the real destruction of the planet started somewhere at the end of the 19th century uh, when the industrialization really took off. But did you know that 75% of all the forests were already cut down before 1850 because all this land was needed for food? And this started to change in the, in the 60s, in the 60s and the 70s of the, the previous uh, century. Because back then, for the first time in history, um, people were able to produce more food, not by clearing more land, but by increasing the yield per hectare. Uh, for instance, take for instance wheat in the Netherlands. In 1920, a farmer on average got only 2,700 uh, kilograms of wheat of one hectare of, uh, of soil. And at the moment, uh, a modern-day farmer gets to 6,500, so it almost tripled. And we did this by access, because we had access to um, synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, uh, the mechanization of agriculture, and by the development of better crop varieties. Um, and so this, uh, this is something uh, we should also aim for in the developing countries. Because if you look, for instance, at the Kenyan farmer living in sub-Saharan Africa, he only still gets 1,700 kilograms of cereal from one hectare. So we, sh we should actually um, give them access to this intensive agriculture. He also needs to, to bear the fruits of this uh, green revolution. Because um, if the yields per hectare if, if, we, if we hire that, then we lift this farmer out of poverty. We give them more food security to the, the country. But most of all, because at the moment, what you see what is happening is that in Kenya, in the quest for more food, this farmer cuts down trees in the surrounding environment because he needs, to, he needs the land for more food. So by intensifying agriculture, by increasing the yield per hectare, we save a lot of nature around this field. Um, and interestingly, oh, this fast. Uh, interestingly, uh, agriculture is actually a double win because uh, it also gets people to the, to the town because agri intensive agriculture frees hands and those hands can move to the city. So is there a catch? Of course there is a catch. We need a lot of energy for this. So we need to triple or quadruple our energy. We need to invest in uh, solar panels. We need to invest in wind energy, but we should also invest in nuclear energy. Because at the moment, nuclear energy is the 
safest way of producing a lot of energy for us to make the transition between fossil fuels and green energy. And that way we can fuel the intensification of the agriculture and the urbanization. So as a summary, let us the coming decades get away from nature and, and save at the, at the same time save nature by focusing on economic growth, intensifying the agriculture, uh, getting the people out of the countryside into the city and triple up our investments in green energy. That way we get a green and prosperous 21st century. Thank you.